Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. Here are some of the media stories we're covering this week. Cause and effect. There are high-stakes electoral politics playing out in Israel, and Palestinians are paying the price yet again. The YouTubers chronicling and powering the protests in Algeria. Pulling the plug on the Internet in Iran, the authorities there impose one of the biggest blackouts anywhere. And Americans living under Donald Trump Hello, darkness, my old friend. are yearning for the sound of silence. War, as the saying goes, is politics waged by other means. In Israel, war, usually waged on Gaza, can be a means of distraction, a political weapon. And that context is often missing in the news coverage. Last week, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu launched airstrikes on the Gaza Strip, what his government called a targeted killing of an Islamic Jihad commander. Eight members of one Gazan family were among the scores of innocent Palestinians killed. However, in political terms, those missiles weren't even aimed at Islamic Jihad. The real target was Benny Gantz, Netanyahu's political rival. Gantz has tried to piece together a coalition government to replace Netanyahu's, one that would have included the support of Israeli Arab parties. Netanyahu is fighting for more than his job. He's just become the first sitting Israeli prime minister charged with a crime, indicted for bribery, fraud, and breach of trust. So Netanyahu could use the distraction, and he knows that conflict with Palestinians, military and political, can pay off. He can also count on those in the news media who tend to shorthand the political context and go long on the dominant narrative that Palestinians somehow pose an existential threat to Israel. We have two starting points this week, Gaza and Jerusalem. Split-screen news viewing in Israel and Palestine. On one side, weeks of coalition negotiations intensifying, with either a new government coming or another election, Israel's third in less than a year. On the other, a fresh Israeli military assault on Gaza, heavy casualties on the Palestinian side with rockets heading the other way. Two stories that, when examined, are really one and the same, since the lives lost in Gaza are a central component of the political negotiations in Israel. The timing of the attacks is a bit curious, considering that Netanyahu is doing his best now to form a government, and at the same time, he's facing potential indictments on various corruption-related scandals. One needs to ask oneself whether or not these things are related. Netanyahu has had a history of initiating or exacerbating violent conflict with Palestinians whenever his legal or political predicaments get a little too sticky. So this is quite a common practice um, by Israeli politicians and especially by uh, Netanyahu to bomb Gaza, to attack Palestinians, to gain uh, political points with the, the electorate, which in Israel unfortunately is increasingly right-wing and increasingly violent towards the Palestinians. Any kind of military assault on the Gaza Strip is seen as a form of strength is seen as a form of defending the national security of the State of Israel, and therefore the dehumanization of Palestinians has become so effective that this is only seen in one dimension, which is one that gives political capital. Since 2008, three of the wars Israel has waged on Gaza have been launched during Israeli election campaigns. This time around, the votes have already been cast, twice, elections in April and September. But the electoral process is ongoing, since neither Benjamin Netanyahu nor his main rival, Benny Gantz, has been able to patch together a coalition government. And Gantz's efforts to convince Israeli Arab parties to support his would-be coalition gave Netanyahu yet another reason, as if he needed one, to play the national security card. He was using that conflict to try to delegitimize any option for a minority coalition set by Benny Gantz with the support of the Arab parties within Israel to incite against 
those who are 20% of Israel population, the Palestinian citizens of Israel. He was trying to delegitimize their leaders as supporters of terror. During this year of elections, Prime Minister Netanyahu's strategy with voters has been to divide, conquer, and if necessary, alarm. In September's vote, his Likud party sent out recorded messages to the mobile phones of the Israeli masses, as it has in past elections, warning them that Arab voters were turning out in droves. But it turned out those messages were actually recorded before the election. Just last weekend, Netanyahu convened what he called an emergency meeting of his party, where he was live-streamed, labeling Palestinian members of the Knesset an existential threat to Israel. As the liberal Israeli paper Haaretz put it, it is hard to exaggerate the gravity of such statements by Netanyahu, inflaming the Jewish community against the Arab community and inciting the entire Israeli public. Netanyahu is the king of optics, and there is a long history of right-wing politicians and figures inciting against the Arab minority inside Israel. But this is the first time any prime minister told the Israeli people that Palestinian members of Knesset are an existential threat. This kind of rhetoric is extremely dangerous so much so that even Benny Gantz said that this is a step too far. But Benny Gantz has also um, been part of this. His election campaign video used footage from the 2014 Gaza war because he was IDF chief of staff. So he was using it to boast about his manliness, um, to show that he's tough on Palestinians. It was a particularly horrific war. Thousands of Palestinians killed and injured and maimed. He even said that parts of Gaza were sent back to the Stone Age. The video that was used by Benny Gantz was particularly infamous. We have a counter in which the number of Palestinians that are killed go up as the campaign video unfolds. And the message is very clear that everyone in Gaza is a terrorist. Everyone in Gaza is someone who deserves to be killed. The video, in a very crude way, makes clear that the only thing that matters in the Gaza Strip, as far as an Israeli politician is concerned, is the number of those killed. And in fact, uh, the Israeli electorate were receptive to those images. So really what we saw this year in the election campaign round was a competition um, between two parties um, boasting about who could do worse things to Palestinians. And in that competition, the Prime Minister has Israel's most widely read newspaper backing him to the hilt. Israel Hayom is a free paper owned by an American billionaire, a fan of Netanyahu's. Its political coverage is so one-sided, it's commonly known as Bibiton, Bibi's paper. But that wasn't enough for Netanyahu. One of the corruption cases looming over him pertains to his alleged attempts to strong-arm another newspaper, Yediat Aronaut, into supporting him. Some people run for office to become commander-in-chief. Netanyahu acts as though he wants to be Israel's editor-in-chief. He was trying to change the media landscape, to control it, so this um, battle over the media is reflected in the media itself. You can see journalists that are, in a very unethical way, loyalists or spokesperson for Netanyahu. Echoing his messages all over, and he has, of course, his own uh, newspaper. Israel Ayon, for example, would uh, publish something that totally serves Netanyahu, then this would be immediately posted on Netanyahu's Facebook that has more followers than any other media outlet in Israel, and this works in a circle. Israel's defenders maintain that for all of its faults, at least it is a true democracy, 
once surrounded by hostile states with unelected, autocratic rulers. But Palestinians know the flip side of the democracy next door. They have paid the price in bombs, bullets, and lives during Israeli election campaigns in 2008, 2012, and again this year. With no coalition in sight, and yet another election likely, Gazans can only hope that the next time Israeli politicians hit the campaign trail, they stick to the talking points and the television debates, and leave the army and Palestinians out of it. For a change, a real one. We're discussing other media stories that are on our radar this week with one of our producers, Minakshi Ravi. Mina, as far as internet blackouts go, the one that the Iranian government imposed on November 15th was as comprehensive as they come. Talk us through the story of the blackout and what led to it. What happened in Iran, Richard, wasn't the jamming of a few networks or throwing up a firewall here or there. This was a total switch off. Fixed line internet, mobile internet, everything was down. According to NetBlocks, a group that monitors internet freedom and tracks connectivity rates, this was the most severe blackout they've seen anywhere in the world. What triggered this shutdown was nationwide demonstrations about a week ago after the Iranian government announced a hike in petrol prices. Now, Iranians are facing real economic pressure right now, and it has been worsened by the U.S.'s stringent sanctions. And the protests were quite sizable. The internet was cut out within a day of them beginning. And how is the Iranian government able to achieve something so comprehensive? Part of it is down to infrastructure. The two exchange points, that is the physical infrastructure through which Iran connects to the global internet, are controlled by the government. Pull the plug on those and it's job done. Now, currently, Tehran says that it has restored peace and that it's bringing the country back online. NetBlocks is monitoring the situation and says connectivity is literally just creeping back in. OK, let's move to the UK, which is about to vote in an election in less than a month. Fact-checking sites are very important, particularly during election campaigns, because they can root out fake news and they do so quickly. Tell us about the fact-checking site in the UK that turned out to be fake news. Well, at the very least, it was a fact-checking site that was misrepresenting itself. Now, this happened during the first TV debate between Boris Johnson, the Conservative candidate for Prime Minister, and Jeremy Corbyn, the Labour candidate. Now, the Conservative press office rebranded itself online with the name Fact Check UK. It then proceeded to tweet out purely political points, even declaring its candidate the winner of the debate. Now, even in the age of misinformation, a political party faking the look of a fact-checking service, that's next-level deception. The Conservatives were called out, but it didn't end there. A few days later, the Labour Party released its manifesto, and the Conservatives created a website entitled LabourPartyManifesto.co.uk. It was complete with Labour's colours, a picture of Jeremy Corbyn on the home page, and it was a publication, basically, of the Conservatives' take on Labour's manifesto. They then boosted the site on Google, paying for it to appear in the top layer of results for anyone searching for the Labour Party's manifesto. It seems that Boris Johnson's entire modus operandi for this campaign is to dress up websites to look like something else. OK, thanks, Mina. For nine months now, Algerians have been hitting the streets, demanding political change. Back in April, they succeeded in toppling the country's longtime president, Abdelaziz Bouteflika, and they're not done. They have rejected their government's proposed presidential elections next month, persisting with their demand of politicians that they must all go. Many Algerians are far too politically aware to trust the state-owned news media, which initially underplayed the protest story and continue to spin it in the government's favour. Long before this year's demonstrations began, a generation of YouTubers, people like Raja Mezayan and Anis Tina, emerged as unofficial spokespeople for Algerian youth. Mezayan is a musician now living in exile in Prague. Anestina is a comedian still posting material from his home in the Algerian capital. Both are getting clicks in the multi-millions. We spoke with the two of them about the grievances they articulate and the political and social change they advocate in the videos they've produced that have become part of the soundtrack of the Algerian revolution.
دونك انا كون جي في لا 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 شونسون لا بروميير ا لول سيستيم ما كان عندي حتى تخمم غير جو فو جوست ميكسبريمي باسكو على بالكم راني في الغربه جيتي اوبليجي نتغرب على بلادي دونك الناس تخرج كان ماذا بيا لو كان نقدر ندخل بلادي ون ونمانيفيستي مع ولاد بلادي ونعيط حتى نتبحبح و فوالا <تصفيق> Voilà, ما درتش حاجة كي سوختي د لوردينير، جي جوست بارتيسيبي مع ولاد بلادي، فوالا. يا رئيس أنا البليس، راهي تعيط، مسيو البريزيدون، نو، يو كانت. مباشرة بعد الإعلان تاع الرئيس، الرئيس السابق على ترشح العودة الخامسة، مباشرة دخلت يعني نوجد في فيديو اللي طلقتها هي اللي سميتها نو يو كانت. هي شغل هذه كانت نتيجة حتمية للمواقف اللي اتخذتها سابقا. ماذا بينا ترجع المفتاح وتروبوزي وترتاح؟ اون بليس خمس وحدات في الديمقراطية ما جابش عليها المداح. نورمالمون مش. على كل حال انا شخصيا نشوف باللي الدور تاعي ما نقدرش نقول لك انا في الحراك انا على كل حال العمل الكبير اللي قمنا به سيتي بالك ترجع ربع سنين لله. البداية تاعي كانت في سنة 2011 كانت هذاك وين بدا اليوتيوب والفيسبوك في الجزائر. السلام عليكم ناس الفيسبوك معكم انا ستينا في البريمي بودكاست تاعي. دونك انا حطيت لا فيديو الاولانية حطيتها قصرة هكذا برك ما كنتش ناوي باللي راحين يشوفوها بزاف ناس مي كانوا كاينين كيما نقولوا دي رياكسيون تاع الناس اترافيغ لي كومونتير ولي ميساج اللي شجعوني باش نزيد ندير فيديو واحد اخرى ومن بعد شغل درجه بدرجه كل كل عام وكان العمل اللي يكون عنده تاثير كبير حتى لحقنا مؤخرا كيما العمل تاع راني زعفان اني زعفان وليدي في السبيطار يموت وانا نتفرج وانتم لا كريب داويوها في الخارج وبصح في الحقيقه شغل حنا خدمناها بامكانيات بسيطه من الكلمات تاعها اللي كانوا كان عند كانوا واعرين لانه كان عندهم تاثير كبير لانه بكل بساطه عبروا عن الواقع تاع الشعب الجزائري راني زعفان راني زعفان ما فهمتش كيفاش خليتونا رطار وافونسينا غير لاريير بورتو ربي عطانا السحاري الجبال والبحار دخلت على الميليو هذا باسكو حبيت نوصل نكون وحده من الشعب هذا تاع بلادي ونوصل واش الناس ما تقدرش توصلها على خاطر تو سامبلومون ما عندهمش قاعده جماهيريه ولا ما عندهمش وين يعبروا على 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 ارائهم على معاناتهم على 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 وش يحبو لا بروميير فيديو سما لو بروميير كليب لي لي دار شويه حس عند الناس سيتي انانيش سي اون شونسون جوستومون كي بارل دو ولاد لي كالكان فوالا دونك على ولاد لي عندهم دراهم على ولاد المسؤولين كيفاش ا 17 ans يكون عندهم اون فواتور سون ميم باسي لو لو بيرمي دو كوندوير ويدخل بها في الغاشي وما يصرى له والو باسكو باباه افيك ان بيتي كو تيليفون يريغل تو سكي ا ريغلي كو تيليفون كوشي ريغلي سي لا بيل في كي ما على بالكم جو جو ماشي با مي مو دونك جو ديزي لي شوز كوم ال كوم ال سون هادشي ما كانش يعجب بيان سور الناس اللي اللي حاكمين مونوبول واللي حاكمين سيستم جي تي كاريمون بلاك ليستي Euh, justement à cause des de mes positions politiques et mon en mon engagement j'ai vraiment subi une pression énorme donc pas de scène pas de chaîne de télé euh, pas de chaîne de radio rien du tout donc euh, j'avais que youtube pour m'exprimer et pour euh, ben je mes, mes chansons ben je, voilà ben je n'ai pas l'air ce que je sais faire اليوتيوب سيتي الموقع اللي فيه كيما نقولوا الفضاء الحر الاكبر في الجزائر بون شخصيا انا عشت عشت اشياء اللي خلاتني نشوف انه الشعب الجزائري ولا تدير ثقه في يوتيوبر اكثر حتى من مسؤولين سياسيين لازمش نكونوا متوحدين لازم دائما متفرقين باسكو حنايا تربينا من اللي كنا صغار على تلفزيون عمومي اللي ما ما ينقلش الواقع تاع الشارع الجزائري ما ولاتش بلاصه لا قرايه لا في السبور في حمتي برك ندورو لا فونسي غير للور اللي راه في التوعي سي بون تفنتهم في قبور في الجزائر اليوتيوب ما تقدر تكومباريه مع حتى قناه تلفزيونيه لانه بكل بساطه ما كاين حتى قناه ولا جرنان ولا بالك مجتمعين كامل اللي يمدوا لك الفرصه انه مثلا تعرض عمل ويشوفوه زوج ملايين ثلاث ملايين شخص في يوم واحد ان شاء الله ربي يقدرنا ان نستغلوا 
هاد هاد القوه اللي في الحقيقه هذه قوه كبيره ان شاء الله نستغلوها في حاجه تاع خير باش نجوزوا لي ميساج اللي يكونوا في الفائده تاع الشعب يا خويا نعرفوها تما شغل هكايا انسان بالا يحكي واش كاين يحكي واش راه صاير واش راه كاين في البلاد تما باش يزيد يوعي تما ناس اللي ما تعرفش دونك حنا توجو نسيو نجوزو ميساج رساله اللي تكون تعبر عن واقع تاع الشعب من جهه اخرى تلقينا بزاف صعوبات دانيارمون خصوصا يعني مع مع كامل واش كان واش صرا يعني بعد الفيديوهات هذوما اللي كانوا عندهم تاثير سياسي كبير مثلا فيديو نديرها يكون عندها دي رياكسيون من اعلى مسؤولين في البلاد مثلا من وزراء اللي يعقبوا عليها ولا يهضروا عليها حاجه ماشي مليحه ولا باسكو يوتيوب بايرا سو مسيو او بروراتا دي كليك دي هادي هو ما يقولهاش حنا 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 نقولوها كاين والزطله لازم العداله مستقله ما تمشيش بالشكاره والتليفون يا خنا السواسيه ما لا تجي الشعب والرئيس تحت القانون كي كنت نكتب في لي بلاتفورم ولا في شو فيسبوك ولا في لي بلاتفورم سوسيال كنت نكتب لي زيدي تاعي وبلي فوالا جي جي تي با كونتونت دو سكي سي باسي كنت جو ميتي لو دو على لي شوز اللي كانوا يصراو كاع تعرف الكم تاع تاع الهجوم اللي كنت نتلقاه من عند الناس اللي هما يكونوا متابعين فورسيمون ليا في الـ في الـ في سور مي بلاتفورم يهاجموني ويقولوا لي انت ما تحبيش بلادك وتبغيو تنشروا الغسيل تاعنا بوندون الحراك بيان سور لي لي زاتاك هادوك تاع لي تاع القنوات على بالك حبوا يغلقوا لي دعوه مخلطه حالتهم راها ما تعجبش الغيطه مغيطه لك لي كاعدنا ما تحشم J'avais des, des amis journalistes et tout, m'arrive comme ça. Ils me disent Raja, on t'adore. Personnellement, t'es quelqu'un de bien et tout. Mais la galbe d'Eruna une autre, la, les chansons sont avec Meijouzouch. Moi, je mets pas de gants. Elle m'a dit Je n'ai pas de gants. Elle m'a dit Je n'ai pas de gants. Soit je dis les choses, soit je scoute. Euh, donc voilà, donc le prix je l'ai payé, mais si c'est à refaire, je ne vais pas jusqu'à la fin. Je suis toujours venu à l'arrivée de l'arrivée et j'ai trouvé des gens. Je me suis toujours dit que si on voit quelque chose, il y a un espoir qui vient de l'arrivée et qui vient de l'arrivée. Qui vient de l'arrivée de l'arrivée. وحنا دوكا بور لو مومون ان شاء الله هذه هي الحاجه اللي نتبناوها على كل حال وحتى الجيل الجديد تاع اليوتيوبر راني نشوف باللي كاينه يخدموا كاليتي مليحه بوتاد حنا كنا الاولانيين وفتحنا البيبان لانه كان من الصعب جدا الحمد لله الناس تقبلت هذا الشيء هذا بالعكس انا كانوا كاينين تشجيعات كبيره في لي ديبي بعد مع الوقت بعد ابري 3 سنين 4 سنين لو كاينين بزاف اللي يعني اللي دخلوا هذا الدومان هذا بين قوسين سمونا في مواقع التواصل الاجتماعي ليوتيوبر سمونا كامل نقولوا صوت الشعب حنا الحاجه هذه اللي ان شاء الله نخدموا عليها And finally President Trump has been churning out the tweets again trying to undermine the impeachment process by trashing some of the witnesses involved Since taking office, Donald Trump has put out more than 11,000 tweets. He has worn out his caps lock key by scapegoating minority groups, vilifying his political opponents, attacking American journalists, and dismissing global warming as some kind of hoax. For satirists, the tweets are raw material. They are the gifts that keep on giving. Trump's Twitter account has caught the attention of the Parody Project. It's a comedy collective led by a filmmaker and composer named Don Karen. The song is a take on Simon and Garfunkel's classic from 1966, The Sound of Silence, and the lyrics have been adapted for a president who has taken the bully pulpit online. We'll see you next time here at the Listening Post. Hello, darkness, my old friend. It's time for him to tweet again But first he'll have to check in with Fox News Cause that's the only place he gets his views And that's how things get planted in his brain Where they remain And it confounds the science 
The problem is he's not alone He tweets to people on his phone 